message uh, today is going to be kind of leading into that, leading up to our Easter service, which is the end of this month. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, uh, if you would turn with me to John chapter 12, and uh, we're going to read verses 31 through 36. John chapter 12, verses 31 through 36. Amen. 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 So if you're there together with me, uh, let's begin in verse 31. It says, Now is judgment of this world. Uh, now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people, or all men, to myself. And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die, and so the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must, must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, Believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. Let's join ourselves together in prayer, shall we? And uh, pray that God will just speak to us from his word today. Father, we just, uh, we love you so very much. Thank you for your presence in this house, in each house where um, this service right now is uh, being viewed. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your presence. Father, I just pray that your word might speak again to our hearts. Lord, I pray that this, this is not just going to be for those that are already your children, but also for, for some, Lord, that don't know you yet, that they would, they would feel your presence and know that you love them and that you care for them and will be drawn to you. Father, I just pray that uh, I'll be able to speak with the anointing of the Holy Ghost in my life, um, through the words that I speak, that the anointing will cross not only to those that are here, but also to those that are in their homes today. And Lord, that they will, in return, Lord, that that anointing will be in them as well to receive your word. It is that anointing, it is the Holy Ghost, and it is your presence, Lord, that prepares the ground for your word to be able to have its desired effect. So, Father, let your word speak into our lives today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You, uh, if you're standing, you may be seated. And uh, we are um, just going to take a look at this scripture today. As I mentioned, we're going to be kind of, kind of leading up to Easter, which is the last service of, uh, of this month, or the first service, actually, of April. And uh, we're kind of leading up to Easter, and uh, if you will continue to pray that uh, we will be able to have an Easter service together uh, in the church together, I would love it to be able to have everybody here, and of course, uh, being safe and, and operating safely, uh, but be able to join together for service on Easter Sunday. Amen. So if we can pray in that direction, that would be awesome. Uh, there's a kind of parallel passage of scripture to the one we just read. It's from John chapter 3, verse 14. And the Bible says, As Moses lifted up the servant, or pardon me, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man also uh, be lifted up. And, and so those passages of scripture go, go kind of together. Jesus told us in John chapter 12 that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And as you know, I've been kind of going through a series of messages on uh, Jesus' words, I will. And uh, so in this particular passage of Scripture, Jesus said, I will draw all men. And that is the title of my message today. Uh, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And then, of course, it goes on to say that, that uh, this he said to them, by, that they would know or at least have an inkling uh, of what kind of death he was going to die. And, and so they asked him the question, of course, uh, that Christ would remain. How can you say then that Christ be lifted up? They must have had some understanding that Jesus was talking about his death. He was talking about the way that he was going to die. And so they're questioning, well, if the Son of, if the Christ is supposed to remain, how can he die? Not realizing that, of course, that 
that Jesus was going to, after three days in the grave, he was going to rise again. And so these these Jews that studied the Word of God had some understanding of what was yet to come. And so for them, at least, it was no surprise that the things that Jesus endured over the next few days after this passage of Scripture that I read to you today. But the background for the passage from the book of John, chapter 3, where Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man also be lifted up comes from Numbers chapter 21, and, and I don't know, most of you probably won't go there, but if you want to, you can get a chance to read that at some point in time and uh, just kind of get a background of what is, uh, what is going on and what Jesus is referring to when he talks about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. Uh, this back story for this passage of Scripture begins in verse uh, tw- or chapter 21 at the beginning with Jesus doing, or not Jesus, but God doing another miracle for the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness. Now, just so you understand, God had already delivered them. It's amazing what he did when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt uh, through the miracles that he did within Egypt. And it's a funny thing that even when the children of Israel, some 40 years later, entered into the promised land, the nations that were in the promised land still remembered what God had done for them in their deliverance from the land of Egypt. It's funny because the children of Israel had forgotten often. But the enemy remembered. It's funny how God's blessing sometimes when we get so used to it that we forget the big things that God has done in our life. We begin to forget our... our, uh, transferal, if you would, from, the, from living in this world and living in sin to living within the kingdom of God and the miracle of God creating within us a new creation and making us altogether different than what we were before. Sometimes in the constancy of God's touch, God's leading, God's blessing, God's miracle, we, God's miracles, we, we tend to forget some of the things that God has done. And so the children of Israel forgot, but but the enemies within, their enemies within the nation of the promised land or within the promised land, they remembered. And when the children of Israel came, they said, we better watch what we're doing here because that same God that did that, that opened up the Red Sea and cre- did all those uh, plagues that afflicted Egypt, that same God is the one that is the God of Israel. And I want you to know that oftentimes people around us know and understand the things that God has done in our lives. Sometimes they remember those things in greater measure than even we ourselves do uh, because of the constancy of God's blessings in our lives. So Numbers chapter 21, children of Israel had, um, they had come out of Egypt. They had gotten to the promised land. Of course, they had not believed that they could, you know, take the promised land because of the enemies and the walled cities and the giants and all the obstacles that were in their way. And, And so because of their unbelief, they were, Uh, condemned to wander in the wilderness for another 40 years. God was going to lead them. He was leading them through that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. And all they had to do was just get up and follow it whenever it led them from place to place. Not only that, they had manna every morning that they could go and collect it. And on, on the day before the Sabbath, they had enough for two days so they wouldn't have to gather on the Sabbath. They had a rock that followed them through the wilderness that when they needed water for their flocks or for themselves, that that rock would produce water for them and, and all of it. And, and so now God, at the beginning of Numbers chapter 21, God does another great miracle for them. They come to, to uh, some Canaanite cities and, and uh, the Canaanites captured some people from Israel. And, and so they came before God and asked God to deliver them or God to do something about this. And he did defeated the Canaanites, destroyed their cities, and that's in verse uh, 3, I think, that God finished with that part of it. And now they're traveling again, and they're still following the leading of where God's taking them to uh, with the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. Now, they get to the place, and I believe it's verse 4. You can, you can take a look at this if you wish, but I think it's in verse 4 that, uh, that they begin to complain. And so they're following God through the wilderness, through their wilderness experience. And in verse 4, it says the people were much discouraged because of the way. And, uh, and oftentimes, and I've thought about this a lot, that, that oftentimes that, 
that through the experiences that God allows us to go, hey, God's not going to pull us out of this world and all of a sudden it's just going to be a bed of roses and everything's going to be wonderful and we're not going to have any problems. There's not going to be any sickness. There's not going to be any disease. And temptation's never going to touch us again because now we've reached that place of perfection and that place of experience with God where, where none of this stuff is going to be a part of our lives anymore. Children of Israel wandering through the wilderness and they're discouraged because of the way, and understand something, God is still leading them by way of the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. So they should have been amazed at the miracle of God leading them. They should have, at the beginning of the chapter, God destroyed their enemies and destroyed the cities that, were, that the enemies inhabited. And, and still along the way they became discouraged. Listen, we all are going to get to the place at times where we're, we get to the feeling like this life is just too much and, and it's difficult and it's hard and, and all the rest of it. And uh, the worst thing we can do is begin to do what the children of Israel did and that's get discouraged to the place where we begin to complain. Well, they had gotten to that place. John the Baptist got there. He had, he had uh, gone out in the wilderness and preached about repentance for, for his ministry time. And had great crowds that, that came out of the cities and came to him to be baptized. And, and he's got all these disciples that are following him and all these crowds. And then Jesus came along and, uh, and the crowds began to disperse and began to follow Jesus. And, and not only that, but John the Baptist's life took another downturn whenever um, the king at that time decided he was going to take John and put him in prison. And there John the Baptist is, this, this great evangelist, this man that preached repentance and didn't mince words when, when the Pharisees came to him. He says, who warned you of the judgment that is yet to come and called them snakes and vipers and so forth. And, and man, he was just straightforward in his preaching. I don't think many of us could have sat underneath John the Baptist preaching. I think probably we'd have been offended many times. But, uh, but the people of that day and age, they, they followed and they wanted something real and so they followed him. But now John is in prison. And he reaches that place that I think all of us from time to time get to, where we just, this whole process that God is taking me through, I don't understand why it's leading me where I am. The children of Israel got there in the wilderness, thought they just didn't understand why God would, would take them into the wilderness, why, why they would have so much problems. And, and they actually said these words, he says, there is no bread and and there's no water, and this, this light bread or manna that God provides every morning, our soul detests it. It is an abomination to us. We just hate it. And they began to complain about what God was doing in their life, and they began to plan, complain about what, how Moses was leading, him, leading them. So the Bible says that they complained about both of those. Well, John the Baptist in prison, he, he said these words. He got one of his disciples. He said, you go in and, uh, and ask Jesus, are you the one? You see the doubts that came in? What, was my whole life wasted? Am I, because of the prison I'm in now, I'm questioning whether or not you are the one that I should have been pointing to, or is there another yet to come after you? And so John the Baptist sent his servant to, to, to ask Jesus. And, and of course, Jesus' answer was, you go, you go tell John. You go tell him the lepers are cleansed. You go tell him the lame walk and the blind see and deaf ears are open. You go tell him these things and it should be enough for him. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. That we're not offended by the way that God works in our lives. That we're not upset that with... Sometimes the things that happen throughout our lives that, that we don't understand as John didn't or the children of Israel didn't and, and that we, uh, we begin to loathe and we begin to complain about the things that God is doing or has done in our lives. Well, they did have bread, of course, the children of Israel did. They had manna every morning, as I mentioned. Uh, they had that rock that followed them that they got water from and so... Uh, when they wanted water, they, God would provide for them. And, and of course, uh, so when they began to complain about their journey and the things that were going on in their journey and began to complain about Moses, God was, was upset with them and, and uh, allowed fiery serpents to, uh, to be among them. And many of the children of Israel were, 
uh, were bitten by the serpents, and of course, uh, many died from the bites of those serpents. Interesting to note, just a side note to all of this, they had sin in their lives before the bite of the enemy. The sin was not caused by the enemy. The sin was caused by something else altogether. It was caused by the fact that they were became unthankful for the things that God had done in their life. If you ever read the beginning of the book of Romans, you're going to notice that, that there is a, a progression or a regression, if you like, in, in chapter 1, where, where it talks about an individual that says, and when they knew God, they chose not to retain God in their conscious mind. And then the next thing is where, where Israel is in the wilderness at this point in time, discouraged and they became unthankful. Unthankful for God's destroying their enemy. Unthankful for the manna that, uh, that arrived every morning. Instead, they complained about it. Unthankful for that rock that followed them that provided water when they needed it. Unthankful for the miracles that God did in delivering them out of slavery out of Egypt and then destroying the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Unthankful for the things that God did. Their shoes did not wear out for 40 years. Ladies, the same pair of shoes every day. Unthankful for the everyday miracles that God had provided for them every single day that they were led and unthankful for the leading of God's presence through the pillar of fire and the, and the pillar of uh, cloud that uh, was there to lead them in the areas that they were to be led and to go. The wages of sin, as, as happened to Israel, the wages of st sin uh, still brings forth death. And of course, the death came about as a result of the bite of the serpents that had bitten the children of Israel. And finally they realized uh, that they had uh, needed to correct some things. And so they came to Moses and they admitted this one thing. And everybody who wants to come to God has to reach this place of admission. We have sinned. That was their statement. We have sinned. And uh, as soon as they made that statement, of course, uh, they were ready to uh, to reestablish their relationship with God and to move away from this sin of complaining about God and about Moses, uh, the leader that God had called to lead them. So Moses was told, uh, God told him, he says, you uh, make up a brazen serpent. He says, put it on a pole. And when you have put it on a pole, he says, I want you to lift it up high in the air. And, and, uh, and when the people began to look on it and, and observe this, this, uh, this serpent that was up on a, a pole, when they would look on that serpent, uh, they would be healed. And, uh, and so it is that all of the thousands of people and, and, and that were bit and all the, the, the whole crowd of them would have been striving to get close enough to be able to observe what Moses had lifted in the air. Rumor would have begun at the beginning of those that were the closest to the serpent that was raised up as they looked on it, they realized that that snake bite was now gone and they were healed from that snake bite and no longer in danger of death anymore. And so it would have passed through all the crowds and, and there would have been a shuffling as some moved closer and some moved away. And, and, but everybody wanted to get close to it to observe it just so that they could be healed and that that bite of the serpent would no longer bring about death in their lives. And, and uh, this is what Jesus is referring to in John chapter 3. This is what Jesus is talking about. So two things that, that we need to understand is, first of all, is that their remedy for their, the snake bite that they had is the same remedy that we need today. It is that, that not a serpent on a stick that we need to look at. But it is, as Jesus said, it is him on the cross that we need to observe so that he would be the remedy for, for the, what ails the human race, what, what makes us who we are and, and causes us to be so far away from God and, and so removed from God through the humanity that is in us and the, and, uh, and the things that dwell within each and every one of us that cause us sin. 
See, it wasn't, uh, oh, it was the fact that, that Jesus died on the cross that is the remedy uh, and the required punishment for our sins was taken by him. He was arrested in the garden. Judas betrayed him as was prophesied that he would for 30 pieces of silver. Judas had betrayed him and then gone up in the garden and kissed him to let the, those that were arresting him know who it was that they needed to arrest. It was dark in the garden, so I suppose that uh, they needed clarification of making sure that they had the right one. They took him, of course, before, uh, first of all, the Sanhedrin, and then, of course, uh, over to Pilate and Herod. And, and in that whole process that Jesus went through during that time, Roman soldiers put a crown of thorns upon his head. They covered his face and his eyes and took turns, the Bible says, hitting him and, uh, and then asking him to prophesy which one of them it was that hit him. Pilate finally, through the process and having his wife warning him and uh, not to have anything to do with Jesus and, and still in his own words, finding no fault with him, still after being pressured by the Jews and, and the cry that was raised by them from before him, crucify him, crucify him, that uh, Pilate finally handed over Jesus to the Roman soldiers who took him and whipped him, then put the cross upon his back and took him to the place where they would crucify him. They drove nails in his hands and in his feet as that cross was laying on the ground. I don't know how that he could have just been able to just submit himself to that, but the Bible says that he submitted himself to the disgrace, to the shame of the cross, to what they did to him. He did it voluntarily and on purpose. It wasn't an accident that they crucified Jesus on that day. He intentionally allowed himself to be nailed to that cross on that day. Then the cross is lifted up by way of men pushing and ropes attached to the, to the side pieces and pulled up and and finally, it would reach a place where it would drop down into a hole that had been prepared for it. And the, the, as it dropped, of course, into that hole, the, the whole, his whole body would have jerked and, and come to a stop when it reached the end of what the nails would allow him to fall. He hung there, bleeding, dying, and suffering. He did it so that we could have a remedy for our sins. He did it so that the bite of the serpent and the effects of the poison of the bite of the serpent could be healed finally in the human race. But you see, there's still a choice. Still a choice about whether we will be drawn to it or not. Does it, does it offend us? Is it too much for us to look upon him as he's dying on that cross? Would we rather see him on Christmas morning as a baby in a manger and perfect and cute and wonderful and, and there he is and would we rather see him that way? And it's great that we know that and it's great that we can celebrate his birth the way that we do. But the celebrating of his birth is not what brings the remedy for sin. It is our willingness to observe, to get close to, to get as close to the cross as we can possibly get so that we can look up and see the one that took away our sin. And only in our observation of the cross and our observation of the one that died on it and the, and the suffering that he went through can we be healed. You see, he took all of our pain on the cross when he died there that day. He took all of our sorrows, all of the things that, that we sometimes uh, wonder about in our lives. He took all of our, our things that distress us and upset us, and he took those to the cross. He took all of our sickness and disease and and, and he took all of that, and that was a part of what he took.
took care of on the cross. But most of all, more than, more than taking my pain or my sorrow or my weaknesses or my sickness, he hung there on the cross so he could take away my sin. It's no wonder that Paul said later in one of his writings to one of the churches, he said, I determined to know nothing at all. This educated man, the one that was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, he, this, this man that was uh, so well educated with all of the world's teachings of that day and age, he said these words, he said, but I determined to know nothing among you. I determined that my education couldn't convince you of what is what is right and what is real and what you need to do. But I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Oh, I would today that, that all of us, as we're approaching um, Easter service and a time when we, we look at the cross and a time when we look at the resurrection, that all of us in our lives would determine that, that all of our education, all of our learning, all of the things that, and I'm not putting a premium on us being ignorant. I think we need to learn. We need to keep growing and we need to keep helping ourselves to, to be everything that God would want us to be. But oh, when it comes down to our sin, when it comes down to the distress of sin, when it comes down to all of those things that sin brings into our lives, I would hope that all of us today would determine to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. For truly, that is the remedy for our lives. We are never whole until the Holy Ghost comes in and changes us. And the Holy Ghost cannot come in except there, first of all, be a remitting of sins through baptism in Jesus' name. And at that point in time, we become uh, the vessel that God can fill, that clean vessel that God wants to fill and keep filling. So, together with me, let us determine to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The second thing, and probably the, uh, the main reason for this ability for Christ to draw us through an observation of Him dying on the cross is the fact that Him dying on the cross is an exhibition of His love towards you and me. There's something that about somebody loving you that just makes them appealing to you. And, uh, and I know many of us can look back and we can think, oh, you know, my mom, maybe my dad, uh, possibly later, you know, a spouse or our children or grandchildren. And, and I love it that, that, uh, that my grandchildren appear to, at least the ones that are close by and even the ones that are further away, that they love us. They love them my wife and myself. I think that's awesome. There's something that just kind of draws you towards somebody who loves you that way. I was over at John's yesterday and helping him tear his patio off. And, and as I was doing so, we went in to grab a bite of lunch. And, and the youngest, uh, of course, is like, uh, up please, up please, up please. And, uh, and if I don't pick her up, then she yells, Papa! And, uh, so the whole time that was lunch, he sat on my knee, and, and um, boy, there's something drawing about, about an individual that loves you so unconditionally and so trustingly. And uh, so the exhibition on the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, is an exhibit of his great love for you and for me. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this, For God commendeth his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Boy, for a good man, if there is somebody that, uh, that, uh, that really liked me and that liked spending time with me, perhaps I would lay down my life for them. Perhaps when the time came, if it was necessary, I would do that. But you see, Christ didn't wait for us to become good enough to die for. He didn't wait for you to get things right and then say, hey, I'm going to die for that person because look at them. They deserve it. They are a good person. But the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He saw you. All that you are, all that you were, and all that you did. And he died on a cross for you. John chapter 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, than a man 
that a man would lay down his life for his friends. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 in the Amplified says this, By this we know and have come to understand the depth and the essence of his precious love that he willingly laid down his life for us because he loved us. If I be lifted up, Jesus said, I will draw all men unto me, signifying what death he would die. I know that typically and, and uh, through tradition, we see Jesus on a mountain high above a walkway. When my wife and I were in Israel, the, there was a, a fellow there that presented a different viewpoint. Because the Bible does say that those that walked by him shook their head. Is it not the one did all these miracles and he can't take them down off the cross? Indicating that, that Jesus' cross or his death was on the, on the side of a roadway or side of a walkway. And that's typically the way that the Romans would crucify. They would do it as a warning to other people that this is what's going to happen if you don't obey the Roman rule. And so they would crucify people along the sides of the road that anybody traveling along the road would be able to see that and not want that same death for themselves. There are two, two drawing powers in our lives. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. James chapter 1 verse 14 says, each one of us is tempted to sin when he is drawn away of his own lust. And of course, James goes on to say, and lust leads to sin, and then sin to death. Two drawing powers in our lives. Whether it's before we come to our knowledge of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him and establish that relationship, or it's after. We still have those two same drawing powers in our lives. Either we will look at the things that, that my own spirit, my own lust, my own desire, the things that are built into me that came about, that iniquity, the Bible says, that, that came down from my parents and, and every person has become a sinner in, in all of this world since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Nobody's exempt from that. We all have iniquities and we all have sin or sinful nature that has been passed on to us, we have that drawing of that sinful nature still within us, but also on the other side, we have the drawing of the cross in our lives. So no matter where we are today in our relationship, whether, whether you're watching this today and, and you don't know him at all and, and you haven't established that relationship with him yet, or you've been living with, for him for 40 or 50 years or, or whatever the case may be, those two drawing powers are still affecting your life and the choice that you make about which one you will submit yourself to is going to determine the outcome of our lives. It's going to determine whether or not we're going to struggle forever in our walk with God and living for God, or whether we'll finally get victory over some of the things that, that, uh, that affect us. Today I choose. When sickness and disease touch my body, I choose the cross. I choose not to complain about the lot of my life, but I choose to go to the cross and submit myself to what Jesus Christ wants to do in my life. When temptation tries to take me, and what's inside of me begins to rise up again, and try to raise sin, tries to raise its ugly head in my life again, I choose the cross, and the freedom that it affords me in my life from the things that I was. Surely the Bible does say that through the 
process of salvation in our lives, we are made a new creation. We are different than we, what we were before. The cross provides that and the drawing of the cross in our lives, if we will submit ourselves to it, can remove that part of our lives. When shame and guilt are again my companions because of something I've said or something I've done or something I've involved myself in, I choose the cross and I choose to be drawn back to its base again. To kneel down again at the foot of the cross and allow the blood of Jesus Christ, which is sufficient to the end of this age, to wash over me again, to cleanse me again from all that has been and all that was in my life. I choose to be drawn First of all, back to the cross, to the love that it exhibited for me. Because you see, he saw me and still died for me. He loved me that much. I choose to be drawn back to the cross, to the forgiveness that it provides through repentance. I choose to be drawn to the cross. That when that blood of Jesus is shed into my life, that there is a complete remission of all of the sins. And the Bible tells us that he will remove our sins from our lives as far as the east is from the west. So that we will no longer be subject to the sins that have touched us so many times. I choose to be drawn back to the cross and its restoration of me as an individual from death to life. And from being broken to being whole. I choose to be drawn to the cross and to the one that hung there. You see, there's a song that says, there's no failure, no fall. There's no sin you don't, that he doesn't already know. And the one I heard this morning on the way to church, the cross has made you flawless. Let's just join ourselves together, shall we, today? It is the drawing of the cross in our lives and our willingness to not turn away, but to look upon it that brings healing, brings wholeness, brings restoration, brings all of those things I talked about today. Let's just close our eyes and let's just worship the Lord. I don't know where you are in your relationship right now. I don't know what's going on in your life or the things that have touched your lives Uh, But I do know that the cross is the remedy for all of it. It's the remedy for sin, for sickness, for shame, for guilt, for all of the things that, that may be a part of what we are and what we've been and what we've done. The cross is the remedy today. Let's just go there together and let's just worship the one that was there that hung on that cross and showed how much he loved us by the willingness that he had to go there for you and for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you. With all my heart, with all my soul, with everything that is in me. Father, I come to you today. Come to this place, the foot of the cross. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you were able, Jesus, through that process, to make me whole again. Hallelujah, ma tottori ari, ma shundari, le kusu tutteli, le ma sondari, ma kusu tottele mahari. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I love you and I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. As we approach uh, our Easter Sunday, uh, let's uh, just keep in mind... uh, the things that the Lord has done for us.